I've been in farming for essentially all my life, and this is a big, big step and big change. I, I feel great relief. I feel great, like I've been very blessed in my life to have had that opportunity to have my own farm. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. There's been a big change in my family. My dad isn't a farmer anymore after being a farmer his whole life. That changed just a couple of months ago after his last red raspberry harvest this past summer. So I talked with him about it here for our final episode of season two on the Real Food, Real People podcast. I'm Dylan Honkoop. Thank you for being here and being with me all season as we traveled all over Washington State, getting to know the real people behind our food. So again, this week is now ex-Red Raspberry Farmer, Randy Honkoop, my dad. And so we get into a little bit of my family's history. You know, I mention it quite often. Um, So here he is, the guy that uh, raised me, the farmer that uh, I've known the longest and I learned so much from as he shares how he got into it and what it meant to him you know, again, traveled all over the state, and we're wrapping up right here, literally right at home. At least my childhood home is where we had this conversation just this last week. Our sponsors are Mana Insurance Group. Thanks to Dan Vanderkoy and the whole team there at Mana for supporting the podcast all season long. We very much appreciate their generous support. You can find them online at manainsurancegroup.com. Find out what they're all about. Um, they insure uh, me, they deal in my insurance policies, and uh, they would take great care of your family on a lot of different kinds of insurance as well. Also, Dairy Farmers of Washington supporting the podcast all season long. Huge thank you to them. Wadairy.org is their website. And if particularly if you're interested in what goes into uh, creating the the incredible dairy products that we produce here in Washington State. Um, you can find out a lot more there, as well as the stories of the people uh, producing dairy here in Washington. So uh, check it out again, wadairy.org. Also, thanks to uh, some of our other sponsors. Um, the Great Washington Shakeout sponsored us this season, as well as, uh, oh, let's see, Williams. Uh, gave us a community grant, and uh, Washington Red Raspberries uh, supported the podcast as well. So we certainly appreciate all of the support that we had to make this season of the podcast happen. You know, normally, I ask people all kinds of stuff about their operation, and because I because you don't know, yeah, and I could say, well, I know I'm going to know the answers to these, but. <clears throat> I think I'm going to ask a lot of questions that I think I know the answer to, but maybe you'll give me a different answer than I think. It's possible. So I'm just going to proceed as if, you know, and I may, yeah, Mm -hmm. I may ask some questions that, well, don't you know that, Dylan? Well, you know, maybe I I don't. So I'll ask you first, just to go into a little bit of your history. When was it that you decided or felt that, you wanted to be a farmer. No. Do you remember? Was well, there a I moment? Wanna... Like, I want to do this. No. Probably not a, a moment in time that I recall. Uh, probably, in a lot of ways, felt like I was probably destined for that because mm-hmm. I did enjoy the farm life, especially as I started getting older and could operate equipment and do things in the field by myself and work for the neighbors and um, I I did enjoy that type of work uh, a lot to be out in the field. But you were farming from day one I mean as long as you can remember. Yep. I'm sure grandpa had you doing stuff when you were probably two years old. No, I don't know about two years old, but I I bet you were out feeding calves. Well, maybe. I don't know. When did you first drive tractor? I was probably about four and a half years old <laughs> when I when I first drove the tractor. 
seems like there's fairly a, unsuccessfully. I might yeah, there, it seems like there's a story about it, but is the story true? So I will ask you the question, even though I think I know the answer. Well, certainly it is true. <laughs> um, unfortunately, um, I certainly had hoped it wouldn't go that way, but um, I was doing scraping some of the uh, slab into the manure pile, yeah. and uh, lo and behold, I got a little bit freaked and couldn't remember that I got a, had to push the clutch in because I was getting close to the wall wire ditch area, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I I didn't put the clutch in, and the tractor kept on going and nosed right through the <laughs> wire and wall and down into the ditch <laughs> nose first did you there, get hurt no no like no, I, I was just sitting on the tractor hanging onto the steering wheel and and there the tractor was sitting there spinning for a few seconds until i came to my senses or realized oh the clutch the clutch <laughs> that will stop this thing so <laughs> It stopped it spinning. Uh, of course, when the front wheels on, you know, were down in the ditch, it stopped the tractor <laughs> there. <laughs> Four and, and a half years old. Yeah, yeah. I was probably wasn't quite ready for that type of driving. Yeah, I was going to say, did, was it a while again before Grandpa put you on the tractor? Uh, I, I really don't recall uh, precisely how long tra- had transpired. Um, it, but it was not, and when he did, it was not in those close quarters. Um, <laughs> out in the field? It was more some out room in the field. to make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, more so. I needed more seat time, and it's possible that I had already done some tractor driving uh, with the hay wagon, maybe picking up bales mm-hmm. or something, someplace. It's possible, but I don't recall it. So let's let's zoom forward a little bit. You grow up on Grandpa Lawrence's dairy farm, which, by the way, he was on the podcast telling his history of that farm. Yep. So this is now the next generation. You're growing up on that small dairy farm. It was the way of life. The whole family was involved. Certainly were. And then you're in high school, you know, junior year, senior year, that time when people are like, well, so what are you going to do? And you know what they mean when they say, what are you going to do? It's what are you going to do with yourself? What's your career going to be? Right. What yeah. What were you thinking at that point? You probably were just thinking about football or something. <laughs> well, it was either football or building something in the metal shop. Yeah. Um, those types of things. Um, fixing an engine. But I, I really hadn't thought very seriously at that stage of my life of which, you know, road that I wanted to take uh, or desire to take at that point. So um, I I hadn't made any decisions at that point. Um, I was, you know, wide open in, in certain respects. Hopefully, you know, I fully expected to be working largely with my hands or whatever, uh, maybe in a mechanical field or farming, even though the farming thing, maybe at that point, well, it wasn't super serious because there was kind of a, you know, a push focus uh, in high school that you needed to probably go to college. Mm. And um, so I was thinking, well, I probably should. And but I really honestly, did, I didn't have um, anything in mind that I would go to college to learn about. In term, you know, I hadn't even considered, you know, ag management or you know, that type of training in a mm-hmm. formal school setting. Um, like I the just, business part of farming. Exactly. Um, Cause, well, because you were interested in the hands-on stuff, right? right? Much more so. Much more so. So eventually when I did get into um, more of my own farming type business or businesses, then, yeah, I had to get up to speed a bit on the, on the business end of it, 
which uh, is relatively uh, uncomplex, um, at least initially for me. So I, you know, had an accounting class in high school, and that, you know, gave me some basics. Um, and I did, my mom and dad had taught me how to keep track of my checkbook or in, well, the savings account before that. I mean, we started saving money at a very young age. And you know, whether it's $9 was the account balance in the, the bank in town or whatever, but we were encouraged to put money in there um, along the way. And yeah. so... So when did that change? When you decided to start farming yourself, and I suppose what you started custom farming, which you know a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with what that even means. Right. Well, at the time, uh, so I was after I graduated from high school, and I um, spent a year down in, in Oregon mm-hmm. at Bible school for a year. And came back from that with um, much more interest in farming. Hmm. At that point, I recognized being away from the farming scene um, that I I really was missing that. And I was working for a neighboring farmer at the time um, when I had time to work off of my dad's farm and this Jerry Leibolt? Yes, yeah. it was. Yeah. And um <laughs> at the time we were uh he w- he was milking cows. Um not a real large dairy, but um there were s- some things that I helped him with. Yeah, w- on his dairy, but the biggest thrill of course was um his doing a little bit of dirt farming on his farm and we actually Worked together um, with Uncle Kel Lickle, um, growing some peas and some wheat and a few things like that, not in great acres. Oh, and there was actually sweet corn. We did, some, Jerry planted some sweet corn, had got contracts yeah. um, to do some of those. Um, and so uh, that was really where I got my first serious taste of turning the soil. Uh, busting open old sod ground and um, turning it over and preparing seed beds and that um, that was a joy to me. I really found a lot of satisfaction of in that and the, the details of that and uh, so uh, within a year or two um, of doing that, then I essentially went into a bit of a partnership with Jerry mm. on the equipment side of things and the far, the dirt farming side of things. And he focused totally on, on the cows at that point, uh, even though most of the money, the funding for the dirt farming was coming from Jerry at yeah. that point. But um, I did a lot of the hands-on work to make that happen. And... That was a lot of fun, and and in the course of that, we um, decided to purchase a a 10-foot drill, grain drill, um, to plant the acres that we were planting together, and we also thought, well, we could plant for Uncle Cal and a few other people uh, that might might want to hire us to do that. So we did a little bit of what were considered custom seeding operations. Yep. Um, not probably not more than 150 acres all told, but it, it was a taste of it, and um, we did that for a year and had our own crops also, and. Um, Right during that time, um, Jerry was um, selling the, his dairy farm where he was at north of Linden to a place down on Pole Road and was um, 
establishing a new dairy uh, operation there. And um, I was involved with a fair amount of the construction that was going on with building a parlor and some uh, big stall barn and uh, those types of things. Still doing some of our dirt working yeah. uh, in those in the dirt work, working seasons, right? Um, but that the new farm for Jerry then became much more uh, demanding of his time, as it, it was uh, quite a significant jump in the amount of cows that he was then milking, and so then he was like, "I don't have time to mess around with this uh, custom farming stuff." Yeah, yeah. And he, so he was willing at that point then to sell out his share of the equipment that we owned in our partnership and, and let me have the contracts or whatever that I could keep getting to grow some peas or whatever, which I did a little bit of that. And um, so at that point then, I guess I owned my own custom farming business. Um, and ended up purchasing some additional, maybe a little bit um, larger equipment to be able to do more field operations for hire. AKA Mo- custom farming, custom yes, work. Uh, working for other farmers, doing their tillage and seeding work, whether that was um, preparation to plant peas or corn or um, grass forage crops dairy farmers was was a pretty big um, area that I um, had for my business so um, that that kind of took off and within a few years I was probably planting upwards of 1500 to 2,000 acres a year um, just with a with a drill the cedar and 10 foot drill no actually oh, you got a bigger one I upgraded to a 12 foot. Uh, very soon because I run pulling the 10 foot I recognized that this takes a lot of hours <laughs> um, so I upgraded because it did a uh, grain drill doesn't take a lot of horsepower to pull um, so that's where I moved up to a 12 foot which was um, about the max you could pull down the road anyway because the wheels for the machine are out on the outside edges, which made the whole machine about 13 and a half feet wide. And with the crowned roads in our county and uh, <laughs> ditches fairly close <laughs> to Narrow the, bridges. Uh, those yeah. types of thing. it became uh, a challenge um, to move it from farm to farm and field to field across the county. So, And so then you kept that up for a few years. Well, I actually, my far, custom farming business, um, I stayed with that until I got eventually into the raspberries. Right. And so it was about nine years all told that I had the custom farming operation. So why did you decide to, to change, get out of custom farming and start doing your own farming and a different kind of farming than you had done? Red raspberries. Um, uh after year six or seven in the custom farming business, my life was um, changing in a lot of ways. I had a, a son come come <laughs> into the family. Oh, that was you. Um, <laughs> that was me. And, uh, you know, things started changing in terms of how I was feeling the responsibilities of life yeah. and where I wanted to spend time because when i was doing the custom farming business i was on the road all the time gone away from the place that was our home so i was out across the county whether it's ferndale or everson sumas even up to acme uh, occasionally and all over the place um, and that i was getting tired of that and i i wanted to um, really have my own farm um, so I could work where I lived um, yeah. if possible. And at this and beyond that, I, I really was tiring of um, 
working or doing tillage work and seedbed preparation um, for other farmers. Um, I really um, had um, gained some opinions about soil um, seedbed preparation by yeah. that time, and it, I thought it would be um, more enjoyable to do my own farming and um, not have the pressure of um, always meeting somebody else's timeline for prepping a field um, that I could, you know, do it the way that I felt was really a, a better way mm -hmm. rather than pushing and, and you know, mudding in some fields or whatever just because I had all my machi machinery out there um, and... I didn't want to have to drive it back for two days and then go back and finish the job. So it 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 didn't le get me give me as much satisfaction, I guess, that type of farming. And I I wanted to figure out how I could do my run my own farm, um, and I wanted to do a type of farming that would require more of me than just. Um, Cultivating the soil, preparing the seed bed, putting the seed be seed in the ground, and later having somebody else do all the other work, the yeah. um, whatever, fertilizing, spraying, harvesting. Uh, at that time, growing peas for uh, the cannery on contract, they did all that. They made all those d decisions along the way, and. So I was looking for something other than growing green peas, which green peas is about the last of the uh, what we called cannery crops back in those days that, that still remained in Whatcom County. Um, and those went away shortly after you got out of it, right? Yes, they, it did. By the, the late 80s, there were no more peas being grown in our county uh, for local canneries, I think. It's possible that there's some acres that were being grown to be hauled down to Skagit. Right. But um, that industry was moving out of our county. Why did it leave? I understood that it left because it was too costly to grow peas here. The land was too, too expensive to rent or own to grow a low-value crop like peas. Um, Peas did not uh, return a lot of money per acre in a gross amount, and uh, there were there were a lot of acres of peas that were grown for, you know, <laughs> uh, essentially no return. Um, mm. It was it was it was a low value crop. That's the way it was, and. W in our county, things were really starting to change in those years, in the late 70s. Um, the value of land, or the cost of land, and or the value of it was really starting to increase. And um, just because, you know, the demand was there for the land. And growing peas here uh, really couldn't compete. Um, to keep the, the acres and the, also the canneries um, that were um, processing and freezing the peas noticed that um, yield wise are on a per acre basis we were not being as we were not as competitive here as some other places like um, in eastern Washington where there's center pivots and drier conditions and um, maybe a little more intensive care, um, less disease problems, those types of things. And the cost of land over there was much, much less. And um, they could, the, since the cannery was coming in and doing all the harvest, um, I would expect that it would have been a lot more desirable for them to have large blocks of plantings, um, that they would bring their equipment in, and we're talking 8, 10, 12 
uh, pea viners to do a harvest, um, it's costly to move all that equipment from one field to the next and you know in this <laughs> our county here fields are uh, 20 acres yes, 40 acres 20, maybe a big field would be 40 acres <laughs> um so it, it's it just didn't fit as well anymore yeah. in that world so they went away but even if they hadn't i i really was not making any money to speak of growing the peas um it was fun to do my own, to, to plant them and follow up on them. I, I did some irrigating in the summer one year, and that was fun because I felt like I was carrying, carrying for that crop, you know, mm-hmm. and seeing what differences that made. Um, so that appealed to me. And um, it was at that time in my life that... Um, when I was preparing um, the soil here on this place that we ended up planting raspberries on, I was leasing it f- uh, to grow peas here, and um, occasionally my, my brother Rick would um, come and sit on one of my tractors and help prepare the field, um, the seed bed to get ready, you know, because the uh, Henry would tell you on which day you were going to plant and you had to have it all ready. And so he would come and help. And um, I remember distinctly one afternoon as he was getting ready to head back over to his little farm that um, he said, boy, this would be great raspberry ground. And it was really at that point that the light kind of came on for me about considering raspberries as a crop that I could be invested in and, would, and start farming my own. You had worked around raspberries a little bit, right? What, well, in I high had, school or something? Yes, Mayberries? My, didn't you yeah. work there? Yeah, when I was a junior and senior in high school, uh, I did work for W.E. Mayberry and Sons is what it was, uh, the, the farm was called. It uh, very soon after that um, time became Kurt Mayberry Farms as his son Kurt took it over. Um, but at the time, I, I had no uh, concept that I would ever be a, a berry farmer. Um, it was fun to go and drive forklift tractors and load trucks and move irrigation pipe and work with some of the um, older guys that were coming back from college, like Kurt Mayberry and Marv Enfield, working out there in the field side by side with yeah. those guys who ended up becoming extremely important uh, berry farmers in our community. And um, just did a, you know, a great job of farming. and But I, back to the story with my brother Rick, um, I really st- started thinking about that seriously. Maybe, maybe if I could secure this land on a longer-term lease, and it was a 60-acre block here, and the soil type was uniform across the whole thing, and it was, it was, probably very well suited to raspberries. So I made work at that point of contacting the, the owner of the, the land and uh, negotiating a, a 10-year lease on it uh, um, to tie it up. And yeah, because raspberries isn't a crop that you can do no, year by year. It's not a yearly cash crop system. It is a perennial crop, and yeah. I was thinking that the life of a raspberry planting would be... Uh, I understood it was about 10 years if things went well. So I did, I uh, talked about the land and secured that, but then at the same time I had to figure out how I would finance a a planting. It's not like uh, we were awash in in cash from the the, uh, custom farming business, Um, but I did have some equity in, in my equipment, I did. I had paid off all my um, machinery loans and all of that, so I had some borrowing power. So I went and probably borrowed 
signed a note for like twenty thousand dollars to get started in my raspberry uh, farm. So um, I did that, and the bankers in town, of course, knew me and my family, and was they they supported that, and away I went, and uh, just one thing led to another, and before long, I. I was going to do it, and I... Yeah, how many years did, or months or years did that take? I mean, your first planting was in 1986. It was. It was. Did you plant... I, you planted in 86, first harvest in 87? That, that's correct. But when when had Uncle Rick said this to you? When had you gotten this all lined up? When did... You know, how long did that actually take? I mean, I was three years old at the time. Um... I, I don't recall specifically. I'm thinking it was probably 1985, spring of 1985, when mm. he kind of put the bug in my ear yeah, about that or suggested maybe I would consider that. Yeah. And so the rest of that year, uh, I was doing stuff kind of behind the scenes to see what I could put together, and maybe this would be a, a solution to actually moving out of the custom farming and doing my own farming. Doing what uh, you wanted to do. Right. Hmm. And things kind of came together. T- and I talked with a um, good friend and classmate, Marty Mayberry, um, another one of the uh, very uh, successful and large berry operations in our county. And he, he thought... Randy, you ought to give that serious mm. thought. He said, I think there's room for more acres of raspberries in the industry. Because I didn't understand at all the whole marketing end and who would buy these things if I did produce <laughs> them. Um, I, I was never really exposed to any of that. And he, he explained a bit how he saw it and felt about it and that um, the market could grow considerably from where it was at the time. Um, In 1985, I would estimate that there were between 1,500 and 2,000 acres of raspberries in the county at the time. So, What is there now? um, Somewhere between 8,000 and 9,000. I think uh, a number of years ago we were... um, approaching 10,000, but some of the acreage in raspberry production has declined. Um, Our volume of pounds produced has not declined. Um, Some of our marginal raspberry acres in our industry have converted into blueberry production, Um, but those were not high-producing fields. So in terms of pounds of production yeah. go into market it it, it was kind of negligible when, yeah. when some of those fields disappeared and i understand why that happened so there you go were you scared at that point putting in that first field i remember vaguely probably more from the pictures of it for, than from actually being there but i was there a great grandpa out helping you and other people helping you put that first 20 acre field in yeah yeah, certainly um, I was taking on a whole new level of risk um, at that point. But, you know, when you're young and you seemingly have your whole life in front of you and you're willing to work hard and do whatever it takes, um, the risk was manageable in my mind. Uh, I don't know if that I would say I was scared about that, Um but I recognized that it was a risk. There were not any guarantees. At the time, uh, the only raspberries growing out here in this area of the county was a two-acre field down the road uh, for UPIC. Um, the Vanderveen's the field. The Vanderveen's yeah. field at the time. So, And then other what, Daryl Eller? Daryl Eller's way about up. four miles east. Yeah. Um, was also growing some raspberries, a lot of blueberries, but he was getting more and more raspberries. Now you're surrounded by them. 
Yeah. Here. Well, now <laughs> it's it's prime raspberry production area because a lot of these soils are very uniform and sufficiently well drained, sandy loam soils. Um, works really good for raspberry production, actually. So I didn't understand a lot of that when I started. Um, but I thought I, I understood that the, these soils were were well drained, and um, I thought I would give it a go. So, if you could go back to 1986, how would you do it different? What would you do different? Uh, I think the only thing that I have thought of over the course of my farming is that it probably would have um, been smart to have started by fumigating the soil Mm. when i started i did not my first plantings i did not fumigate um the soil so and the reason i say that um i should have is that uh, um at that point it was the soil was um nice and clean there wasn't any big raspberry roots or other raspberry plant debris that would uh, harbor disease organisms um, and the fumigation would have um, been more thorough because of that and cleaned up the soil potentially i don't know how big of difference that would make but that would i think it's about the only thing that i can think of um, that i would have chosen to do differently back in those back in the, the mid 80s um, so, so you plant in 86, how long was it until you really felt like, yeah, this is for me? Oh, it was probably a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, liked it right away. I, I really well. did. Um, because it, uh, the field rec- then required care, mm-hmm. uh, ongoing care, you know, weeds, uh, building trellis, um, some you know spraying to manage some insect populations from time to time even though i was um still you know pretty ignorant about a lot of the things that were happening in in the raspberry field but it it was really enjoyable to go out and spend a lot of hours out there and see this crop growing before my eyes and it was very exciting to see that. Um, I enjoyed that very much. And uh, those early plantings, they did, they responded really well, um, grew great. And uh, I remember I was expecting my first harvest the following year in 1987, but lo and behold, we actually did some harvest uh, late in 1986. Um, a harvest of plants, uh, not berries, mm. but um, the field look, looked very uh, healthy, vigorous, and um, there were some other folks that were wanting to get into raspberries and needed plants. Um, and in those days, um, a lot of times people would not plant certified stock. Yeah. Plants that were propagated on a farm right. for making, they would just divide off of a, a other fields. newly planted field sends up a lot of sucker canes, and I had never even un- understood that very well. well. Wasn't that how you planted your it, first field? It was, field? but these plant, the plants I got, I just went over and picked them up, and and they were all in bags, and I <laughs> <laughs> hadn't really thought. Who was that from? That was from Marty Mayberry. Um, from the Winfield on, um, what is that road where Crafty, just down the road from Crafty there. Um, so, um, Willie's Lake Road, I, mm. I believe yeah. there, across yeah. from the lake of Willie's Lake yeah. there. So, that's where I got my plants to start. And they they did well, like I was saying. And people started asking me if I would sell them some plants. Um, this was in like October, November. 
Um, and you had just planted them probably in what, March? Yep. So here yep. you are already selling something from your field, making money off this field exactly. before you pick a single red raspberry off of it. Yeah, I was <laughs> very, um, very excited about this. I thought, wow. <laughs> um, it was something I was not expecting when I started, yep. but I probably sold $20,000 worth of plants. Wow. That first winter now that certainly wasn't all profit because i it was a lot of hand labor and shovels going yeah. out there and yeah. and doing that and um so that there you go and i was off and running and i felt somewhat successful at that point as a raspberry grower um even though i still had so very much to learn but i was sold at that point that this is this was what I wanted to spend my time doing. Um, understand that I still had my custom farming business, which I had ratcheted way back um, in the year, in 1986, the year of planting raspberries. And uh, after that year was over, I had decided I want to do this full time on the raspberries and stay home. So. Essentially, I I started shutting down the business and didn't do a whole lot of any custom farming for other growers at that point. And um, I was off on my own then, doing my own farming. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but then in '88, you know, we actually moved out here onto this right. field. Very well, remember that. And yeah. um, there. It was perfect in my mind because I I wanted to work where I lived because at the time when I planted in 86, we were living uh, several miles away uh, on a different property. And so then to have a place to live here where I was doing, spending most of my time farming, it was it was really what I wanted to do. I, I loved it. It seemed to be working. Can pay the bills, make the payments um, on the equipment and the plants and all of that stuff. And I was off, and that's yeah, what I wanted to do. I loved it. Now looking back, now uh, you know here we are. How many years later? 35 years later. What does it feel like to say that's in the past now? You're not a farmer anymore. Well, having just retired from raspberry farming three or four months ago, um, I have mixed emotions about it. Um, a part of me, has, you know, will want to... Um, continue to grapple with the challenges of weather and the impacts that the, this winter weather will have on raspberries, even though it's not going to affect me uh, in my crop because I don't have a crop anymore um, for that harvest. So um, that will be a, a change. Um, but I, at the same time, am very relieved not to have the pressure of um, having money at risk, um, dealing with labor and getting things done, um, and overall the, the level of, I would say, stress um, goes down significantly when you don't have an operation um, to make work for another year. Um, even though I loved what I did, I, at the same time, it was a challenge, always, uh, year by year. Um, there's never any guarantees that you're going to make enough money to pay your bills, um, provide for your family, um, move toward, you know, your own financial goals of setting some money aside for the future, um, all of that. So I, I'm now moving beyond that. Um, 
So it's a, it's a new and different experience for me. I'm just thinking, just, really, have you ever not been a farmer until September of this year? Really, no. I've always been connected other than maybe the eight or nine months that I lived down in Portland, Oregon. Um, <laughs> but then, even then, I, th- I thought about the farm. Yeah. But I've, I've been in farming for essentially all my life, and this is a big, big step and big change. I've, I feel great relief. I feel great, like I've been very blessed in my life to have had that opportunity to have my own farm, um, make my own decisions, and live um, with the results of those decisions. Yeah. Um, it's, you it, know, it's, it's at once um, thrilling and scary yeah. to do that. You've also described it as bittersweet. And you, you're talking about, you know, the positives looking back. Mm-hmm. Do you have regrets? About the farm? Any, anything. How, how you feel now. I mean, what? I, I don't want to just gloss over the bitter part of the bitter and sweet of, you know, moving on. Well, I... I I don't have a lot of bitter parts. Um, certainly, we had our struggles. Um, we had some extremely lean years where it was it was difficult to know how we're going to make it um, to the next season and get some more income coming in. Um, but um, we figured out a way, you know. We, always you know, tighten the belt and hmm. I did some some work off the farm in the off season and you do what you have to do to try stay in business and keep doing the thing that you really have passion for even though you know in that given year um, it doesn't make good dollars and cents for that year but there's always then the hope next year is going to uh, come together in a much better, more successful fashion, and um, yield will be better. And the, maybe who knows where the market's going to be. Um, that was just that was the li- that's the life of a, a berry grower, um, making huge investments and hoping uh, with fairly good confidence that you will get a a good return on that investment. No guarantees. Some years, you know, you can lose a lot of money. Other years, you can make a lot of money. Um, but I guess I've I have learned over that um, time that I'm in it for the long haul, um, not just this year. Um, if this year was a poor year or a great year. That uh, doesn't mean anything about next year. It could be totally different the following season. So, and that that's a little bit of the excitement of it too. Was will I be able to figure it out? This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. <laughs> 